Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we give you thanks. We give you this thanks for this chance to praise you. We give you thanks for this chance to learn more about you. We give you thanks for your word. God, guide us that we may be faithful in our task. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good Amen. evening, friends, Amen. and welcome to another edition of Scripture Talk. Uh, we are uh, continuing to do Scripture Talk um, in a socially distant fashion, um, in large part because we have the world's small, one of the world's smallest studios, and the concept of fit... You, I'm barely six feet from the wall in here. Uh, so we are, uh, we're still via Zoom, um, which again, like it's just what everyone's doing. Um, but we are happy to be here nonetheless um, and able to continue to share this with y'all. Um, I am Pastor Trey Comstock and with me as ever is, go Brandy. Sister Brandy Dudley. Go Scott. Pastor Scott Ketchup. And go Stacy. I'm Mark from Ort. No, 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 no. Yeah, this to, you, know, you do raise an interesting point, though. We now need if, if so. There's I read all these articles about how the handshake is dead, um, and that's probably overblown. Um, but maybe you have offered us another way that we could greet people. Um, you know, uh, you, you've you've got that. You know, good, live long, and prosper. Uh, I've thought we've, we've thought a lot about you know what if it's it's just the Wakanda salute, Wakanda forever. Um, you know that that one's pretty. Yeah, that one's pretty good. Uh, we, we live in interesting times, friends. Uh, so our scripture this evening, okay, so kind of the under the surface of what happens with the show is we try to, as best we can, keep up with the Christian year. Again, not because someone told us to, but because it, it's a way of reliving the story of Christ's life um, every year to remind us uh, this kind of key foundational thing. And so coming up uh, this coming Sunday uh, is what's called Ascension Sunday, which guess what is where we celebrate where Christ ascends into heaven. Uh, it is exactly uh... a week. Right. It's a week before Pentecost, uh, which happens after the ascension of Christ. We try to like from like Monday, Thursday on, we try to live it in roughly the time span that it happened. Um, so you have Monday, Thursday, you have Good Friday, then on the Sunday you have Easter, and then X number of weeks after Easter you have Ascension Sunday, and then X number of weeks after that you have Pentecost, or one week after that you have Pentecost. This is roughly the time span as reported in the Bible, that's why we do it this way, and so this coming Sunday, um, well, we don't necessarily have the pomp and circumstance to it, being who we are. We do try to live the story. And so this Sunday is Ascension Sunday. And so go figure. We're going to uh, read um, Luke 24, 44 through 53, which is the story of the Ascension in Luke. That just makes sense. Then he, Jesus, said to them, these are my words that I have spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. So, the ascension itself, not much happens, right? Jesus ascends into heaven, period. Okay, great. It's what he gives them before that that really matters about stories about Jesus' ascension. It's what happens immediately before, and then obviously, we'll talk about this weekend next week, what happens right after, which is Pentecost, which is the descent of the Holy Spirit. Because you get something special happens, in someone's last chance to tell you something, right? The human mind naturally remembers the first thing and the last thing. Uh, we remember, you know, even for Jesus' life, right? Everyone knows Christmas. Most people knows, know Easter, 
first and basically last or close to last. So here with the Ascension, we get Jesus' last chance to talk to his friends. And what does he tell them? Well, he tells them a version of what they are to do, which then becomes what we are to do, which is, look, I did what I was supposed to do. I came into the world. I suffered and died. I rose from the dead. I'm ascending into heaven. You now need to tell people about what have happened, what has happened, starting with Jerusalem, but not ending there because this needs to end up everywhere. So you get kind of Luke's version of the Great Commission. We know the one in Matthew better, but uh, they both kind of sent around center around this idea that Jesus gives this last piece of instruction before he arises into heaven. The fact that he opened up their minds, I think that's a gift amongst himself because I guess up until now, their minds were discombobulated with everything that he had done over the past three years. And now that he has kind of spilled out all that he had to do to get to this point, they had to be mentally ready to, I guess, decipher all of the scriptures so they could be effective in telling his story to all the world. So I like the fact that he just crank open their minds spiritually in a way to say they can understand what they're going to go into now. Well, I mean, a lot had happened, right? I mean, you know, even in the past few weeks, a lot had happened. And it's a lot to download because that, you know, it's not like he opened their mind. It didn't happen in a moment, right? That's what's happening in the space between Easter and he rising from the dead and flash forward to when he ascends, right? There's a period of time, but even still, it's a crash course. A lot, you know. It's yeah, just, he is literally handing. He's literally handing the keys of the kingdom over to them. He's yeah. like, you know, I'm uh, heading out, and uh, you guys now will uh, take what we started and run with it. And uh, you know, I've one of my favorite to the Ascension stories after he's he's gone up, and they just stand there watching. He disappears in the clouds. And apparently they stand there staring for a bit because it yeah. talks about an angel or is showing up and being, okay, you, you've seen him go. He will return in this same manner, but it's time for you to kind of head about your business now. <laughs> yeah. So that, so Luke kind of circles back to this story a second time um, in Acts chapter. So that part of it is from Acts chapter one. Um, yeah. So you yeah. got to remember yeah. that, you know, Acts is the sequel to Luke. They are written not as one work, but as, you know, as kind of two pieces of the story, one being the life of Jesus and one being the life of the early church, all compiled by the guy we call Luke. But it, again, it is, it is a work by two works by one author. And so Luke circles back to the Ascension and with, with much the same, de- with much the same events but Luke adds in extra detail in the Acts 1 telling where it's like, yeah, stop staring at the sky. You've got work to do. Go back to Jerusalem. Get ready. Something else is coming. I like to know what kind of effects were going on when he was ascending into heaven because in my mind, I see this gust of wind is picking him up and sure. taking him on up to heaven or something, you know? Uh, well, see, the, the, the show that I watched, and I realize it's probably over-exaggerated and everything because it's a TV show, but uh, the TV show that I watched called The Bible, um, when it showed the uh, resurrection, he, uh, there was an angel that was kind of floating over the tomb, and uh, the big uh, rock that was in front of it kind of moved, and Jesus ascended kind of like a ball of light, bright light. Yeah. And then the angel just kind of looked down at the uh, the temple, uh, the the tomb guards, and the tomb guards went uh, went to the went to Pilate and told Pilate, "I'm sorry, we fell asleep." <laughs> right. Just, yeah, it sounds nuts. Well, so for for all the like art that has been made about the ascension, like we don't. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of detail. Yeah, really don't know. We rely. No. This is what. This is one of those ones where we end up relying on artists to kind of give to to fill it in a little bit, right? Um, why are you being weird? Um, all right, because you know we li- like the moment of the resurrection. Um, you just don't get you don't get the detail. Like you just know that 
Jesus rose? What did it look like? We don't know. Right. Uh, because the what we're getting, what we get in the Bible is a some of it is writing style. So some of it is that the way you know Greek authors, which is who we're dealing with here, wrote was very different. Um, you didn't. You don't always get character. You don't always get a lot of description. Sometimes you just get. They really like speeches, though. What Greek authors love is a good speech. They don't necessarily care about what did the scene look like, right? Also, if you think <laughs> about it, they don't have. They're not worried about making the movie version of this because there's <laughs> never been movies, right? You know, some authors nowadays write so that oh, this will make a great movie. There were no movies, um, so we just we, don't. We fill in the detail through art. And, and so much of this aspect was just had to truly be mind blowing to the poor disciples. I mean, they, they've been on this up down emotional ride. You know, they had the, the three days of where, you know, uh, they, they lost Jesus. He's dead. Then all of a sudden he's raised from the dead and uh, it shows up. And then they've just spent, you know, about 40 days you know, h- hanging out with him. And then the Ascension, he's, he, he's leaving them again. And they're, you know, in, in some ways, you know, they're probably thinking, we, we just got you back. Yeah. Aww. And, uh, and now you're <laughs> leaving Where again you and you're telling us where to run with this. Um, yeah. Okay. So I was going to ask you a question, Trey. Um, mm-hmm. Speaking of the art, and everything of, of the of the Bible. Um, I know it says at the end of Revelations, <clears throat> excuse me, to not add or take anything away from the book. Do you think that sometimes when they take artistic um, stuff like that, that they're they're committing a sin like that? No, it depends what you mean, right? If you are a painter trying to do your level best to relate the glory of something. No, I don't think so, right? Um, I think it, it, it depends how you are presenting it, right? If you are, I think to me what that has always meant, um, and it is a, it's a line you got to walk, is making sure this isn't about like you saying, this is what the Bible says, even, when, even if it's not quite what the Bible says. Right. So I don't think it's such a bad thing that we portray a donkey in the, my favorite one, right. That, you know, that we portray a donkey in the nativity story. There's no donkey in the nativity story. It's just not there. Um, there may have been, who knows, right. But we always portray Mary on a donkey. No, that's just artistic license filling in stuff that the text doesn't give us. It's when you present something that the text doesn't tell us, and then use that to expound your truth. That's why you got to be really careful in actually reading the Bible rather than reading what you think the Bible says. Well, it's kind of like movies, religious movies that are made that they tell you at the beginning, you know, this is an account of scripture, you know, it's dramatically done up for theatrical use, but please study your Bible. You know, the real truth here, you know. You know, there's that big difference of, you know, this is how it might have been like versus, no, this is what it is. And that adding to scripture of just adding to something, trying to claim it has that same amount of authority, definitely uh, getting into error. Whereas hypothesizing about what it might have been like, especially if you're looking at a book like Revelation, because so much of that is just him trying his best to put in words what he was visually seeing that he was, you know, probably having difficulty with. And so it's the same way of what you you mentioned, Uh you know, uh, well, he kind of went up into the clouds until we couldn't see him anymore. You know, and uh, you know, what's, what's, what's really cool about that one is that, you know, he, you see him going up into heaven, but you see he's still alive as he does. So, And uh, that uh, return promise, you know, that comes in Acts about him returning, but just that he's given those promises throughout it. And just really just this show of, I'm always going to be with you. I am still here. And now you are going to run with this. And which is literally where we're at with what we're doing with our ministry and all of that is acting out some of those instructions that he gave them right at the end, you know, in the Matthew account is where you, 
you know, you, you have what we refer to as the Great Commission, you know, that uh, tags along with this story. And so it's just a, an awesome, amazing thing to realize he's alive. He's returned to God with uh, that authority that comes with being at his right hand and then has, you know, passed some of that responsibility down that comes to us, which is, you know, in some ways just, whoa. Well, right. And part of what Jesus is creating here is a scenario where this is kind of a no excuses. Um, so I am leaving you, but you are being, I am not, le- I am physically leaving you. I'm not going to be walking alongside you anymore. Um, but you don't get to use that as an excuse for then not doing something with this. Instead, I'm, where we're going next week, right, is there's going to be this whole new source of power that's going to come into your life that will allow you to do exactly that. So go, worship, get yourself ready, um, because something else is coming that will allow you to do this. And this is where, you know, certainly it would be easy enough for, you know, especially now, but, but anytime, right, you know, now is particularly weird um, but there's always, there's always great excuses of why, to, why you don't have to reach out or, or why you don't have to, you know, a- actively, you know, seek to bring others to Christ. Oh, it's awkward. Um, oh, I feel strange. Oh, what if they don't like me? Um, you know, and, and these people uh, who Jesus is talking directly to, a lot of them died for it. Um, you know, there was danger and toil that they went through uh, to get there. And so, you know, I, you see, you know, you see their experience, you see how they lived it out. Um, they took seriously this kind of Jesus is, you know, presents this of like, no excuses, y'all. Y'all know what to do. Go and do it. I give you the, pa- I'm giving you the power here very soon to do it. But like, you, you don't get to get out of this just because I'm leaving. This is the instruction I leave you with. Keep doing the thing I've been doing. And to piggyback on what Scott said about him being with us, I, uh, verse 51 pops out saying, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. It's while he was blessing them and going up, that's letting me know he's still blessing us even though we can't see him. He's still blessing us and he's always with us. They, I mean, the uh, disciples got something that we didn't get a chance to do is see him go up into the crowd while the, he was being, uh, he was blessing them. But we still had an opportunity to, to get what they got at that moment was be blessed by him to do great things for him. Well, right. And that's, and, that, and that's the descent of the Holy Spirit. That is largely in the descent of the Holy Spirit that comes in Acts 2. Again, the, the next piece of the story we'll get, we'll get to next week. And that's one of those things to re- rem- always remember about Pentecost is at that point, we're living in the same age as them, right? Up until uh, Pentecost, they're in a different time. Right, because they got to, you know, as you talked about, Brandy, they got to walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus and put their hands uh, in the nail holes and, and see the miracles directly. And we only get the indirect; we get the, you know, you know, secondary and tertiary reporting, depending on you know which gospel you're reading, right? Um, so we we only get that. But once the Holy Spirit descends, we're all on an even playing field. We have the same yeah. source of power that they did. Right. This isn't, you know, especially when you read the Old Testament, a lot of people get guilty of, oh, that's Bible times stuff. Um, That's a different time when people live 900 years and, you know, massive floods and you could fit every known animal on a boat, whatever. Right. But all of that, all of that excuse making disappears with Pentecost, because at that point, we're playing with the same deck that they're playing with. Just we're no longer illegal. And in most of the world, although there are places where the church is still very persecuted. Um, So we have, we have it easier in a lot of ways. Um, And and we have this access to the same Holy spirit that they do. And and so we can do the same, all the things that are happening there um, in Bible times, 2000 years ago is stuff we can be doing in the here and now as well, because we have the access to the exact same power source period. And that is just awesome. That's what makes this uh, time period that we live in just uh, amazing. 
Um, we have a good uh, comment here uh, in Joe talking about uh, Jesus' ascension. Uh, well, it's like getting kids ready to leave the house or drop them off at college. I trained you to be an adult. Now go do it. But you can always call me if you have a question. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Right. And so the, there is that element of you're going. I'm not. The, the relationship changes. You have now have a responsibility you didn't have before, but also it's not a you're abandoned, go figure it out, right? That's the, the son of the spirit is, you know, I, I am, you know, I, I am here for you. I've got your back. I can help you, but you've still got to make this work on your own. You've, you've got the responsibility for this because in the end, even Jesus if you think about it, so Jesus is the son of God. And so Jesus can do whatever, but largely Jesus operates, you know, at a scale of one human and one, it is very difficult, especially in the ancient world before Twitter and, you know, the internet and television and, you know, the telephone, uh, one human can't really reach the whole world. You know, you I, that, I, right. Yeah, right. Probably. And that's uh, exactly well, some things that I think we often forget, you know, uh, Jesus is the son of God, but he purposely laid aside uh, a lot of aspects of his deity. And so uh, what he was doing while here on earth was operating as a man by the movement of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, in that ascension, it, it was important for him to do that. He had to do that. He even makes a, a comment and um, there that it's uh, better for them that he does go away when he's referring to the sending of the Holy Spirit or how that'll open up is what you'd already mentioned earlier, Trey, of it, us all being on the same playing field, having access to the spirit as a whole versus while Jesus was here and it was centralized to him being in one place, one location because of the restrictions he took upon himself in becoming fully man while fully God for that whole salvation story to play out. Right. And so one human in Roman times is just one human. What give, what allows the gospel to spread is that it be, the mantle gets taken up by many humans. Um, and we, we know of some of them, but if you read Paul's letters carefully, uh, particularly Romans, the end of Romans, there was the whole group of evangelists doing that kind of work. Paul, um, rises to prominence for a number of reasons. One, Paul is clearly the best writer and may just be the best at it, but he was not the only traveling evangelist. And so you have this whole generation of people that come even after the disciples. And, and again, you got to remember, Paul, big deal, but Paul isn't present at this moment, right? Paul doesn't show up for a few more chapters um, until the, the killing of Stephen. Paul's alive, but Paul represents that next generation of leadership um, and we think of it just being him and a few others, but really there were does, probably dozens of these people traveling throughout the Mediterranean world, testifying to the good news that the disciples themselves had spoken into their lives. And you start to see how it spread and how we get to where we are today. Slowly, uh, yeah. but surely, right, over 2,000 years, but how we get here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a fun thing to read through uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It gives a little bit of uh, telling of where some of them ended up, uh, the apostles. And, and I've always uh, found it interesting, though we don't have much on uh, uh, the person who they voted to take uh, Judas's place, uh, Matthias. Matthias, but, um, yeah. it, uh, Tradition shows that he went on and did... Uh, a lot of good work as well. And so um, I think it's just kind of interesting because even in that process with, with, with him is that uh, this was an individual that they pulled out that their requirements was that he had to have been with them from the very beginning. And because it was important for them for the, the start of this, for people to be tied to the full story, you know, uh, and so they were going for those eyewitness accounts and because they knew that, this way that it was going to work was going to be this one-on-one, -on -one, uh, maybe two-to-one type thing of passing it on. And uh, uh, Emily kind of made a allude to that in a comment saying, it's important to remember that discipleship model that we were given, train 12 to go and train 12. And you know, because it's that the multiplication factor, uh, it's all focused on that relationship and getting that uh, 
true understanding of what's going on, you know, like that's like a Timothy 2.2, training uh, other peoples who are in turn able to train others also. Well, that, so that's how you that's how you get to exponential growth, right? Uh, we as the world have unfortunately learned a lot about exponential growth uh, in this weird time that we're in. But the Bible, the, the gospel itself, grows exponentially because of because it becomes distributed. And that's part of what gives it its strength. But one of the so I, I think I've told this story before. Maybe I haven't. Who knows? I talk a lot into microphones, but. One of the weirdest moments I ever had was I was in a uh, pitched verbal battle with one of those evangelists that shows up on college campuses to tell you how terrible you are. It's a really great way to win people for Jesus. Everyone loves right. it. Um, you know, stay, and this guy would show up on our campus periodically. And if one day I just lost it and I was just sick of it. Um, you know, as a person of faith on a college campus and just then this joker shows up and it's just like, what are you doing? And so anyways, I ended up in a, I ended up in a pitched battle. And so he would be yelling his whatever. Um, and I would stand on the uh, right, ac- I stood right across the room and just read all verses about how much God loves you um, because I'm a jerk. Um, <laughs> and this really ticked him off. And and he called me an enemy of the gospel, which I found rather funny because um, I was literally just reading the gospel. Um, and then he made a comment that has stuck with me for, I don't know, 15 years now that still makes me angry. And it's that no one ever came to Christ through like one-on-one teaching. That no one in the Bible came to Christ through like one-on-one evangelism. It was all people shouting in street corners. Now, let's be clear. Peter does some shouting in street corners and a lot of people come to Christ, right? So that, like, let's be clear that there's a, there's a grain of truth to what he's saying that, like, Peter gives this grand speech in front of thousands of people impromptu on Pentecost Day and 3,000 people are saved, okay? So, like, I get that that stuff happens, but really, no one came to Christ through a relationship with another person? Wow. That Ethan I mean, Right off the bat, you have uh, Philip and the Ethiopian. Uh, right. You know. Yes, for and- a perfect example. Yeah. <laughs> just two of them talking Bible. You got to well, say got just, baptized. Or just you know, like the disciples right? themselves come to Christ through a direct, not because Jesus yelled at them, but because Jesus was their good teacher and journeyed with them. Anyways, what were you going to say, Stacy? Oh, so uh, kind of on the same thread, but not. Um, can you ask me, um, well, answer me. Uh, I don't know how to put this. Uh, what is wrong with Kenneth Copeland? Oh, who knows? I, you know. I, I, I seen this yesterday. Um, I, this is my experience with it. I seen this thing yesterday about him and a bunch of other studio um, evangelists that were there. And he, he blew the wind of God yeah. to get rid of COVID-19. So and, I mean, some of it is just is a different it's just a different belief structure, right? Or just or a particular maybe not even a different, just a just a a, a particular way of understanding how God works, right? You know, I I can't you know I can't pick apart or I try not to. Although I dump on Joel Osteen, so clearly I fail at this a little bit. But like I try not to dump on other pastors' ministries or other people's styles, right? Well, here's, so here's, here's why here's why I did. Um, it, cause I, you know, I look at some of it and go, this is silly. Okay, whatever. And I take it as, not for, with a grain of salt, but to me, this hit me with, especially now all eyes are on, uh, God a lot. Um, sure. I think non-Christians and, and, and people that already poo poo on us see that and go, see, there they are, those goofy Christians. Yeah, you know, I think sure. I think to me personally, and, and I've talked to other people about this, and they told me not to worry about it, but it's been something that's weighing on my heart, been weighing on my heart, is we're, we have a hard enough time getting out there and, and spreading the, word, the seeds and the word of God and trying to bring Christians in without somebody like Kenneth Copeland getting on TV like that. And, and, and trust me, it has been, uh, it has gone viral on videos nice, yeah. of him, like, you know, look at these weird, this weird preacher, you know, and I think it's just, it's almost like, and this is just personally my opinion, uh, 
that it's one step back for us when when evangelists do stuff like this. Well, hey. you, you know, Stacy, um, that kind of stuff with uh, people doing healing ministries and different things like that, and having uh, outlandish ways of doing things has actually been around for a long, long uh, time. And um, I, you know, I've always kind of wondered, uh, you know, and I've been to services that have been like that, and, and I've seen God do some crazy things. Uh, and, and the Bible has some examples of some crazy things of, you know, Jesus and Peter's shadow passing people being healed, praying over cloths and those cloths healing. But one of the things I like to think about was uh, there, there's a place where the disciples come and they tell Jesus that they'd seen some people casting out demons in his name and they rebuked him because they were not with him. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jesus made the comment that, you know, just I'm kind of paraphrasing, but basically uh, let them be because if they're not, against us you know they're, they're they're for us and if they're you know it's hard for someone to say something bad about me if they've done a healing in my name and so uh, i think the importance of what you're talking about uh, highlights why we as individuals need to study scripture and uh pray and seek him for ourselves to be able to see when things are off but also just to be mindful that okay if this isn't blatantly against scripture and it is bringing glory to God, then maybe there's a place for it, for uh, of how it ministers to other people. And because uh, there are certain types of, you know, Christian music and stuff like that, that just doesn't float my boat, but it uh, works for other people. And it's just, you know, I think of that and I always think of, you know, that uh, when David come back into Jerusalem and the person was up on the hill uh, uh, cursing and, and, and yelling at him and one of his men asked him if he wanted him to go uh, kill him and he said no for all i know god put him there to keep me humble and so it's just i think what trey was saying is and when he was saying about being careful about what we say about other uh, ministries and stuff is that you know uh, god does sometimes meet people where they are and even though it might not be uh, the way we think it, it should necessarily go a hundred percent if god is using it and he's not blatantly pulling people away then just be mindful that it all comes down to our own personal relationship well and also there's another piece of it that is understanding that different things are going to work for different folks yeah and that and that's part of our strength right part of our strength uh one of the key strengths that starts with jesus giving this instruction where it's no longer where jesus no longer has the primary teaching responsibility now we as inspired by the holy spirit have that primary teaching responsibility is that that means some folks are going to operate differently. And that means some folks are going to be able to reach some, some different folks and a different kind of folk and be able to reach different kind of folks, right? Uh, you know, this is, people like to dump on, you know, uh, traditional worship because it feels stuffy. Well, it doesn't feel stuffy to everybody. It just feels stuff, stuffy to a punk rocker like me. So like that wasn't going to reach me. Um, but that, I had to, and it took me some time to, you know, because I, I grew up with it kind of shoved down my throat, but it took me some time to realize, no, the Holy Spirit's present in there. It just may not be how the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And so there are probably people who were reached by what Kenneth Copeland did. There's also people who are turned off by what Kenneth Copeland did. But I know that's, both of those things are true about my own ministry as a pastor, right? There are people who dig the vibe we put out there in the world, and there are people uh, for whom they want nothing to do with us, right? Uh, and so part of our strength is that we are diverse, and the Holy Spirit can speak through a wide variety of people in a wide variety of ways, and it works out in the end. And so, yeah, when I watch, you know, I watch that clip too, and yeah, it's goofy um, to my eyes, right? Sure, but that's not how, that, that is not how I experience God in the world. But just because it's not how I experience God in the world doesn't mean it's not how someone experiences God in the world. And so someone who is probably not the people I'm talking to, but someone who I'm not talking to, who I don't even know was reached by that. And I couldn't have reached that person. And Kenneth Copeland did. Um, So am I going to like hang out with that dude? No, I think he spray paints his hair on, frankly. Um, And that's weird. But that's not like who, like on some level, that's our strength, not our weakness is we can speak in so we can speak in tongues. We can speak in so many, the different version of speaking in tongues, but it's, we can speak in so many modalities 
and the Kenneth Copeland is just one. And I, I yeah, you're right. I kind of roll my eyes at it because again, not my thing. But that doesn't make it wrong. Um, that doesn't make him bad. Um, there's a comment in the chat. Um, God can use whomever he wants uh, to, uh, to bring people to Christ. My own parents got saved because of Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, you never know, right? Um, and so it is to approach, there are things that are clearly wrong. We, we can't fall truly into a relativism, right? There are things the scripture allows and things the scripture doesn't. Um, and, and so we need to always be discerning that. But we also need to, you know, stay open-minded to think that things that look nuts to us, because let's be clear, things that we do look nuts to other people. Um, that is yeah. the nature of faith, nature of yeah. faith and belief. Uh, All right, and that's, and that's, and that's kind of what, like, when I seen that, that's the first thing that come to my mind was it wasn't so much of he's right or wrong. It's, Oh dude, you make us look like so like no, stupid. No, just use yeah, your but, spirit of discernment, man. Just pray for discernment about things. Try the spirit with the spirit to see if it's fake and shake or not. Because you, you, you like everybody's saying, God can use whatever he wants. We'll be saved by the foolishness of the gospel. So, right. you know, he can use, if he can use, my, my favorite line is, if he can use a jackass to deliver a message, <laughs> he can use us. Yeah. Okay. No well, doubt. Well, the, well, the other piece of it is, you, you got to realize that there are people in the Christian world who think we're nuts. Who look at us and how we do church um, and how we do intentionally led by the spirit to do church the way we do it, the way we dress, the space in which we worship, um, the manner in which we worship. And they look at that and go, man, the spirit can't be in that. That's nuts. Look at them rock and rollers, right? Yeah. Um, that I'm uh, not, you know, hmm. wearing robes or a toupee or whatever. I, I don't know how I'm supposed to look clearly. Um, like, and, and look at that and judge us. And, and so, but yet we know that people are reached. God uses the ministry that we do. Praise God for that. Uh, and, wow. and so, you know, again, it is, there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And we, in Brandon's yeah, right, we definitely. need to discern it. Um, but also, thankfully, it, it is not necessarily ours to judge, but God's. Um, one last right. comment in the chat and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll end things this evening. Um, Emily's got a chat in the chat. Uh, fortunately, so often God works in spite of us instead of because of us. Praise God. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. No. No. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. By the way, uh, before we go, Trey, um, I just got this on my phone. Uh, rest in peace, uh, Ken Osmond. Uh, you'll know him as uh, from Leave It to Beaver. Uh, yeah. Eddie Haskell. Eddie Haskell. Yeah. yeah. He was, uh, he was 75, so uh, we'll hold him up in his, in our fam his family's prayers. With that, we'll end for this evening. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Another edition of Scripture Talk. Uh, we'll be back with you next week with another show. Um, always record live uh, Mondays at six o'clock on Facebook Live. Uh, assuming uh, Palestine Grace, uh, Facebook.com slash uh, Palestine Grace Church. Assuming Zito Media allows us to do so. Yes, uh, thank you, Zito. Thank, thank you, Zito, this week. Shout out to Zito. Um, there's also an audio version of the podcast available after the fact to search Scripture Talk by Grace Church in your favorite podcatcher of choice. If you have any comments about what we've talked about, please uh, throw them in the comments on Facebook. Um, this goes up on YouTube. You can leave them in the comments there. Uh, you can email us at gracechurchpalestine at gmail.com or leave a comment over on our website, uh, uh, palestinegrace.com slash video. Um, and with that, go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. And remember, fear Time not. to dance. Stay well. God is with us. Now we dance. Time to dance. Yeah. Yep. Oh, we're so goofy. Not to be goofy. Look, I'm doing the robot.